What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. I'm Scott, and I'm here with Michael and Drew, as always. And today, we're ranking the Daedric Princes. A bit of a fun one today. So, let's, before we get into it, let's talk about the parameters real quick. So, we're ranking them based on a combination of power, influence, aesthetic appeal, X-Factor, their realms, their Daedric minions, their artifacts, their stories. It's just going to be a big, subjective sort of session, because we didn't want just to make it like, oh, what's the most powerful, most influential? We want to sort of, you know, basically determine our favorites, but we've kind of got to agree to try and make this list a thing. Yeah, for sure. But I thought it might be a good idea if we start with the bottom tier. We'll try and group them into tiers, sort of a bottom, middle, and top tier. And then once we get to the top, we'll then sort it out from there and try and find the best. So... Bottom tier suggestions. Let's hear right, it. I'm going to jump straight in and say, even though there's some cool stuff to talk about with all of them, and, and that is an important thing. Like, they're all very cool. But I think we can safely put Periite into the I bottom tier. I assume that would be the first name mentioned. Yeah. I love my yeah. boy Periite. I'm going to have to defend him. Go for it. All right. All right. Well, do you want to do you want to say why he's so, uh, you know, kind of... Well, well, I, I would tier. say... <laughs> Even though the whole weakest Daedric Prince and stuff is all like debatable and so on, and I agree with that, I just think overall things like natural order and, and the sort of pestilence and stuff like that are just kind of boring. And we don't get a lot of periite exposure, really. Like there's the cool, like, yeah, the little vomit afflicted guys. Spellbreak is a pretty cool artifact, but it's kind of more, you know how it's more Dwemer related anyway? Mm -hmm. Like I never really think of, ooh, periite when I think Spellbreaker. Um, so I don't know. I just think he's boring. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. Just, he could be interesting, but from what we've seen of him, he's just, you know, yeah, he's not prime. Yeah. Well, I mean, as you've, as you've already mentioned, it's like, it's so important to say right now before the thousands of people, you know, say we've got it wrong, but basically there's no such thing as strongest. They're not like humans. They don't really pay attention to what we think is power. They're all, you know, we can't really understand them the same way. It's not like looking at a king. So, you know, we understand that, but we're kind of, you know, it'd be pointless if you just said, oh, nothing matters anyway. We've at least got to try and kind of, you know, look at them. And another disclaimer too, is that even though we're putting them into lists and there's going to be some at the bottom, the Daedric Princes as a whole are pretty cool like compared to other gods like heaps of the other adria like zenithar or something way more boring compared to um the daedric princes so even the bottom tier ones are still like the daedra uh like honestly some of those interesting parts of the elder scrolls lore in general so even though if we put them at the bottom that doesn't mean we hate them they're just you know not as cool as some yeah of them. i yeah. mean i really like periot like i think periot is cool but mostly when i look at periite i think of potential like i think periite especially being so unexplored has a lot of potential to be one of the coolest or a cooler one but as it stands like all we have to go off is what we know in the law what we've seen happen the experiences we've had and i just don't think there's enough content out of periite which is part of the reason why periite's interesting is because he kind of works in the background anyway you know, keeping things in natural order and wiping things out with disease if need be. Um, kind of goes against Jigalag's idea of determinism, though, because if it's really the natural order, you shouldn't have to do anything, if you know what I mean. Like, if, if natural order yeah. is just cause and effect. Yeah. But then it also depends on, like, the, diff the distinguishing... The, the difference between, like, natural order or Jigalag's idea of yeah. order. Like, you know how you can see is like, order as in, like, civilization and, like, perfection and logical and, like, you know, put into boxes and mm. castes and categories and all that kind of stuff is, like, some real heavy sort of order themes there. Whereas, like, natural order is kind of... Yeah. So, if, if I'm going to stick up for Periite, it's like, I, I kind of agree. he's He is bottom tier, but just... To throw him a small bone so that we can't, like, definitively say he's, you know, terrible. Um, the idea of natural order, at least my interpretation of it when I was talking about Periite in a video, was that if if that's going to plan, then you shouldn't really be paying attention to it, if that makes sense. So if, if everything is progressing normally and nobody's thinking about Periite, then, th then that's his natural order in action. So it's him being successful. He wants to operate 
behind the scenes if he gets involved a lot then his natural order is being taken over by you know say his own ego or getting involved and being you know talking to mortals a lot then you're kind of interrupting your own natural order so that was a i see what yeah. you mean i see what you mean yeah yeah well it's settled the most boring <laughs> terrible daedric well dream. i think it's also worth saying at least he has that title taskmaster which is interesting like he deals with all of the more well, actually i guess it's kind of boring all of the more menial uh plane of oblivion tasks that the other daedra don't deal with you know he keeps things running yeah he's what is that like a i don't know his front desk or some, something yeah, that's more the clerical thing is, uh, things don't work without the little guy doing the f the the stuff you don't pay attention to you know so that's yeah but you, but you don't put the janitor <laughs> at the top of the list yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well s since we've mentioned um jigalag already let let's talk about jigalag because for me at least i think he's cool he's got cool like order aspects and so on and like his whole like interaction and stuff with sheogorath and his backstory is cool but if you actually look at him it's kind of boring. Like he's just kind of just knights of order. We're just plain. We're just like, it's a cool, cool aesthetic kind of look, but I wouldn't be worshipping Jigalag. No, I, I think, think worshipping Jigalag yeah. is a terrible idea. You basically, I believe, lose free will in the way that, you know, it's commonly understood. So you end up just as a mindless knight of order, I guess. And yeah, that's but not very fun. kind of, yeah, I, I just think a lot of people like him, but I don't know. I think he's bottom tier for me. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I, th I think people generally think he's very powerful because, I mean, mm. obviously, you've mm. got the story of the Daedric princes coming together to screw him over, basically, and turn him into Shea Gorath. But, um, I mean, I, I might come off as the contrarian in most of these just because it's fun. <laughs> and that's what I do. <laughs> but, um, I, like, uh, when I was thinking about Jigalag, he's kind of trying to establish order in oblivion which is just naturally so chaotic it's like you can't really put order to all this chaos and then you've got the gray march which is his bringing order but then every time he does it it counts for nothing he has to do it all over again and that's kind of the definition of insanity as well so yeah, doing the same thing over so and over you know and it's kind of like yeah. he was always destined to turn out as share Gorath and be completely mad See, I, I think so much... The problem with Jigalag is so much of his appeal hinges on the fact that he and Sheogorath were once one thing. But, like, in the contemporary time, like, fourth era, they're, like, officially split into different beings. So Jigalag's kind of just, like, this boring order thing off and, and you don't we don't hear about him anymore. Or, you know, it, it just doesn't have the... He's, his coolness, to me, at least, is dependent on his relation to Sheogorath. Yeah. I 100% so agree. If anything, that could be one of the factors we talk about later as to why Shea Gorath will rank highly. I mean, I can already see that meme, like the Virgin Jigalag and the Chad Shea Gorath. And on Jigalag's side, it's <laughs> like tries to invade, always fails, like yeah, yeah, believes in constant order. Everything stays chaotic. Well, I, I think we'll, we'll go with Jigalag, Periart in the... By the way, actually regarding Periart real quick. We've always said Periite, mm. but um, could you also say Periite? Uh, I mean... <laughs> like, like, we always go like Periite, as in like Peri Peri Chicken, but you could <laughs> go like Periite. Like, that would also oh, I'm work. sure it's pronounced in the game as Periite. Yeah. Yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me question myself just by associating it with Peri Peri Chicken, but I... Pretty sure it's Perry. Uh, <laughs> I just can't go down yeah. the rabbit hole of making sure you pronounce these really obscure words perfectly. It's mm. like, c come on, yeah. it doesn't matter that much. You know exactly who we're talking about, so it's fine. Well, the thing is as well is that in game, and it's kind of annoying, is that the voice actors pronounce different things differently. So you'll often have people like, oh, you're saying it wrong because they heard one character say it. But then another character yeah. will say it completely differently in the same game. Don't even get me started on Elder Scrolls Online. Yeah, Nereverine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh. oh, especially when it's Azura um, too, like a really someone who should know how to say it. Mm. And Azura comes out yeah, and says the Nereverine, and I'm like, uh. hit us with another bottom okay. tier one, one that's gonna be in the bottom right, tier. I'm gonna say, um. Probably Namira. Like, obviously, 
Namira is... They're, they're all interesting. Like, people will listen and they'll be like, mm. what's the good Daedra? What's the boring Daedra? Like, they're all cool. Uh, but I feel like, for me at least, Namira would be in the lower end of things just because, yeah, it's like disease and, and well, not the, the gross stuff and slugs and cannibalism. And I, d I do like when it kind of draws on, like, the part of her that I find more appealing is the kind of, like, ancient darkness. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Her sphere is literally the void, the ancient darkness. So it's it's kind of a bit yeah, mysterious. There's, there's cool parts. And also, it, it kind of also... This is the thing we have to kind of factor in, but with some of the Daedric Princes... Their appeal increases when it's through the lens of certain other cultures, like some of the Khajiit um, view of Numira is interesting. And, and that's the same goes um, for a bunch of the Khajiit views on certain um, gods that makes them more interesting. But it's the same as like how even, you know, Azura, Boethia and Mephala are far more interesting through the eyes of the Dunma versus others and so on, you know, Oh, as for well. sure, for so sure. Like, I mean, Sanguine is really interesting through the eyes of the Khajiit as well like in small nuanced yeah. ways. So I totally get what, you, what you're saying. But I, I generally, I think I still do agree in terms of there's not, like even in, in the games and stuff, there's not as much, like if you do the, I'm pretty sure, um, there's, so there's the cannibal one in Skyrim. I actually forgot the Morrowind one. The Oblivion one was when you go and you're just killing some priests or something. And I remember drinking the wine to get your personality really low. So you could do a quest. But like it, she... There's not a big X factor compared to some of the others. Like, there are going to be some which we'll get to, but... Um, well, one thing about Nimira as well is her followers aren't really going to be doing much. Like, say you talk about Meirun's Dagon. His followers are going to be trying to change the world, trying to destroy the world or whatever. But Nimira's followers, as you can kind of see in the Oblivion quest, is like, they're just kind of dirty and they just want to hide in the dark and, you know, they're filthy. And, and if, if someone tries to liberate them or, you know turn their lives around then namir is like nah kill those priests i want my followers the, the, to suffer um, the beggar story is cool as well mm. the one where the it's a it's a wood elf weedle prince or noble or something yeah. i remember that's the biggest mistake i've ever made on the channel was i made a joke about weedle evolving into metapod but that's another story <laughs> and i i knew i was gonna get so much crap for that <laughs> yeah i i reckon namir is safe because we're gonna we're going to try and get through some of the bottom and mid tier ones quicker because we're going to need a lot more discussion for the top yeah, tier ones. Yeah, for sure. Just, so, wait, just um, quickly, the reason you didn't, you don't remember Namira in Morrowind is she didn't actually appear in Morrowind, aside from being mentioned in books and some NPC dialogue. At least that's what I'm reading now because I couldn't remember it either. I'm like, what was Namira's quest in um in Morrowind? There and you it go. says, yeah, Namira was one of the Daedric princes who did not appear in Morrowind, so that's why. Mm. I mean, I do, I do like some of the, um, in the Reachman lore, I like how there's a few Daedric princes there and Namira's one of them. They potentially re revere and I like, and Namira also has some cool connections to Hag Ravens, but it, none of the, this, a lot of this is like, um, you know, interpretation and so on. It's not as like, oh, solid hundred percent. It's got to do with Namira, but if, if she does sort of lean into the sort of Hag Raven kind of, um, dark ma ancient darkness magic kind of stuff and that would be cool but we just don't have enough like confirmation i guess there's cool stuff with namira but this is the thing once again there's going to be cool things with all the daedric princes but we're trying to make a subjective list to try and get to the drew what's what's your what's your next offering for the bottom i tier? think bottom tier i'd put meridia there me too yeah, yeah. okay i i agree i do like the reason i do is because of the Aurorans mm. and Umaril, the Unfeathered, and her general connection with the Aelids and so on. Actually, Meridia is a good example just to... Um, because people go, oh, she's a Magna Ghee, which is technically... Well, she was true, but... And we basically want to talk about, like, oh, just real quick, what a Daedric Prince kind of is. And really, it's basically somewhat... It's basically the most powerful Daedra who run something in oblivion and technically she was a magna Gi, but she sort of um came back and settled in oblivion and made her own realm so she's kind of a daedric prince but um what well, yeah i mean elaborate. i'm only just thinking about this so i could be wrong in some aspects but i guess it comes down to the initial definitions of adra being our ancestors so the ancestors to mortals and daedra being not our ancestors 
So if the Magna Gi, yeah. even though Magnus and you know the god of god of magic and all of those guys were really involved in the creation, they they left just when it was convenient. So they're yeah. they're no. It's kind of like where do you the the problem is drawing the line between like et arda like original spirit and then when do they become Adra? Yeah, like. Do they, did they have to stay in Mundus to be classified as Adric? But then again, you would consider Magnus as an Adric entity or like people do. But that just might be a, you know, loose definition. Like there, there's there's wiggle room because in the same way, um, Trinomac was an Adra. And if you buy into the whole story that he was um, eaten and pooped out and turned into Malakath, who is a Daedra. Do you mm. know what I mean? It kind of, it, it makes it a I mean, little... And then um, you have Hermaeus Mora, who's a Daedric prince, despite the idea that he was created from the leftover scraps of creation, creating the world. So yeah. it's, it's hazy for him as well. I feel like the firmest, because there is, there's a lot of little exception kind of stuff on the corners of, of um, the definition. But I feel like if you just go, they're super powerful Daedra. They have an oblivion realm to themselves. They're sort of like a Daedric prince as they're called, you know, it's not, um, yeah, so basically, yeah, Meridia's running, um, it's it's the Coloured Rooms mm-hmm. or something, isn't yeah. it? In, um, but yeah, I guess there's not... In, in ESO, she has some more um, stuff that she's done, a little bit, pushing a little bit more of the um, evil side. Like, if you're looking at, at Oblivion, especially, like, she just, her quest isn't that interesting. And she's not necessarily, like... And it's she seems more typical through just some of the quests we've done for her, she's like, oh, I'm, I hate Daedra and Undead, kill them. Like Dawnbreaker's cool and so on, even in Skyrim, but it kind of seems a bit more typical. But where she's more interesting is all the connection to the Aelid kind of stuff and how she's, you know, yeah. kind of, you know. And that, that's one of yeah. the reasons I think, I remember Zarek saying he hates her and, and says, you know, he, she, he's not yeah. a fan of her because he considers her kind of not too moral. And another interesting thing I wanted to say about Meridia was actually how she's all about the light, you know, like with Dawnbreaker and and people say mm. she's obsessed with the light of Aetherius because this is what she was kind of cast out from when she became a Daedra. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's, she has this yeah, obsession yeah. with the place that she kind of well, cause fell her, from, but like was removed from. Her Well, her realm is kind of, I think it's, almost literally a reflection of Aetherius, isn't it? Because I can't remember the exact terminology from the book I read, but um, the the idea was that when they were all going back up to Aetherius, she kind of shot off into oblivion using Magnus, some of Magnus's light, divine light or something like that. So her to, realm um, is kind of a, a mimicry of Aetherius as well. I'm not sure, but in Elder Scrolls Online, so, it's like a big coral place, this like is a what, coral reef this... and floating stones and stuff. Yeah, so um, she was thought to be one of the Magna Gi that fled Etheria soon after the creation of Mundus for supposedly consorting with illicit spectra. She was cast out of Etheria and took the mantle of a Daedric prince. She created her own realm of oblivion known as the Colored Rooms by bending and shaping the rays of light from Magnus, the sun. Um, yeah, that's yeah. cool. So, yeah, but, but look, she's cool. I, I also love, I get, this is this is lore. I'm, I'm not uh, just swearing for no reason, but the shining bitch <laughs> is also what she's referred to as. It's one of her nicknames, along with the glister witch or lady of greed. But I like that that whole element of Meridia makes her more interesting rather than just the, the light. And it's cool. It's a cool contrast too, like this, because a lot of people like associate like light with all of that holiness and kind of like, you know, get rid of the undead kind of thing. But I like that, you know, she's just not necessarily a good person either. Yeah. Well, sure. something else to put on Meridia's resume is you could say she's involved in the creation of Mayroon's Dagon as well. Uh, refresh my um, memory. On I, that. I'm double checking to make sure I've got this right, that she was still involved with the Magna Gi, but the idea was that Mayroon's Dagon was created in the bowels of Lig by the Magna Gi. They oh, were yeah, trying to create right, a god of hope. As a tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're... Is it explicitly that she's well, in the Magna Gi? Well, I, I think it general. specifically says the Magna Gi, but this... I guess it would have been before they left, they fled, because, I mean, it's the Dawn era, so everything's a little bit shaky. Yeah. And then there's all the Lig and the Kalpas yeah. and the this and the yeah. that. Which and is like, not we'll a topic for probably. now. Yeah. 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 We'll, we'll save that for other discussions. But yeah, we'll, we'll put her in the, in, the, in the bottom tier as well. I'll just add that. 
So here's another suggestion, and this will send um, people who love orcs into a head spin, but Malakath in the bottom yep. tier. You know, I, I made um, a tier list before coming on the podcast, and so far it is exactly my tier list. Like these are exactly yeah. the ones I've got. I, I split it into four tiers, but I mean, you know, yeah, this is in all in tier four so far. Yeah. Um, yeah, just Malakath. Malakath's cool. But there's not a lot to him besides, I love orcs and ogres, and and I was pooped out by another god. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I love Malakath, know. but any argument I make for him wouldn't be arguing that he's in any way more powerful than other Daedric princes. Mm. Like, I, I like the kind of patriarchal aspect of him, where he's, you know, even though he was corrupted, he's still somewhat honourable, like Trinamac before. So you can, you know, talk about how he he maintained aspects of you know, the hero champion of Auriel. But at the same time, Trinamac was never the most powerful entity ever anyway. So even that argument wouldn't really push him up. Yeah. Although some people do debate that he was pretty um, powerful Trinamac. That he is... And then Boethi- Boethia had to, you know, deceive... Well, the, there's the idea that Mafala came and stabbed him in the back when Boethia distracted him or, or the other way of, around, one of the two. Yeah, th- th- that whole thing has a few versions of it. But, I mean, there's, um, there's, it's also worth just re-clarifying that this list isn't necessarily the most powerful. It's, mm, it's also yeah. like the coolest or like, you know, the ones that, that really uh, you the, enjoy the see, most. Mm. There's going to be a default kind of bias because you're limited by the information... Mm available so for example like characters like you know Mehran's Dagon and Molag Bell and stuff they have way more exploration so there's a lot more to go oh yeah that's cool and that's cool and that's cool and they have all these cool elements whereas some of them like Periart for instance doesn't have enough they have the potential to be higher like maybe in future games or future DLCs for ESO or something they're explored um, to a much larger degree and then that might push them up the ranking but we can only work with sort of what we've experienced yeah so th- there is a little I mean, bit something there, but... I, I really do like about Malakath is that some consider him kind of like a, a Daedra for, for mortals, you know, like a anti-Daedra Daedra. And, and you can see that with uh, the weapon, Scourge. Scourge, yeah. Because this banishes any Daedra that you hit it with. So Scourge is like, a, I guess, a mace forged yeah. with, I think, Sacred Ebony. Um, in the fires of Fickle Dyer, but I'm not sure if Fickle Dyer was ever explained. Yeah, it is cool. I, I do like how when they sometimes um, sort of, well, it's as is the case with Meridia and, and Malakath because they were kind of technically like adric sort of entities before becoming Daedric princes. It's cool that they sort of hang on to some of their anti daedric kind of vibe. Like they don't, they, they've still kind of, like with Malakath, he's still got that honorable sort of thing and the anti data through his um, mace. But then also like Meridia's kind of got that, uh, you know, she's obsessed with the sort of the stars and the Aetherius light kind of stuff. And she's like, oh, I hate undead. But then, you know what I mean? There's that cool like little friction with their um And, and similarly to Periite, Malakath has Volendrung. So another dwarven kind of ancient artifact, which is cool. But it, it also especially in Skyrim, doesn't look particularly Dwarven. Yeah. It looks very Daedric. Yeah, yeah maybe it's yeah. warped. I mean, it could be. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm going to offer up uh, Vaymina as well for bottom tier. Are we even in bottom tier? We've already got five. I mean, if... if... Well, there's, there's 17 Daedric Princes, so I feel like the bottom tier is kind of going to be it's got to at least kind of be a third or a... This moves you know up mean? to tier three for me, but yeah, I mean, it still makes sense. It's still down the bottom. Yeah, like I I, I would put Vaymina there. Like it's cool, the Nightmare stuff. I love her um, interaction. There's a story where uh, Sheogorath and Vaymina try and make that dude insane, that artist mm-hmm. insane. And... Um, but Sheogorath wins out there. If anything, it's kind of a story that sort of shows how cool Sheogorath is. But... Um. Yeah, I don't know. Because he was like an artist, and she sent him all these nightmares, right, to make him create all this like messed up stuff. Like, 
Yeah. But then, so she, so he, for years and years and years, this artist was getting all of these crazy nightmares, making all of this really warped art and stuff. And um, it made him quite famous, but also, you know, some people reviled him and so on. But then Shea Gorath, to win the bet in the next 10 years, he simply did nothing. He stopped because there were no more yeah, nightmares yeah. from Vemina. So he did nothing. So then he went, the artist went insane because of the silence, because he didn't have his inspiration or anything anymore. So um, it was a cool little twist. I forgot the actual name of the, the story. Yeah. I, I remember that. But still, I think it, it's one of them. <laughs> I think it was um, Myths of Shea Gorath, perhaps. Could be. Because the, there are a few. Um, but we'll, we'll get to Shea Gorath because he's not, he's not bottom tier. But uh, do you agree, Drew? Yeah, pretty much. Vemina in the bottom pretty tier? Pretty much. Not much to say about Vemina, really. Yeah, uh, I would say that uh so what's that one two three four five six probably need a little more in the bottom tier like who else would you throw under the i do you know what i'd actually suggest as much as people like i love his quest and stuff because hangover I was, man i was gonna say the same thing actually sanguine yep. i also find his realms kind of boring I like it's like because he doesn't have like a there's not like a nice airtight like here's my theme of my realm it's like i have billions of pocket realms yeah and they're basically whatever yeah. the individual mortal wants so it doesn't really yeah, have its so own identity a, so you just imagine lots of bdsm realms <laughs> lots of like, like of wall street basically drink yeah you know and it's like yeah cool but like you know he doesn't have that um oomph you mm. know or at least I think like he's he's got fun mission like quests, but yeah, I don't know. It, they're cool. Like like I said, they, these are all still cool, but they're not enough to be like the top. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I reckon we can we can start talking like what we would call like our middle tier. So things that aren't going to be in the top. But yeah. So so any suggestions for? middle tier i actually be just before we get into middle tier i have one thing to say and it was what i wanted to say before about the khajiit and sanguine and i just yeah. like how according to the writings sanguine's not evil by nature but his fear distracts khajiit from the path and, and like kind of seeks them to urge like to to follow their urges and pleasure without purpose and i just like that little nuance of how because you know how the khajiit are all into their moon sugar and stuff so for this danger, mm. it's kind of like, oh, he's not like really bad. He's just a distraction. I yeah, just found yeah. that really interesting. But yes, mid-tier. Mid-tier, I'm going to chuck in... I would probably put Nocturnal in mid-tier. I would have put... I mean, this is all mid-tier, but I was going to say if there was a bottom of mid-tier, I'd put Clavicus Vile, I think. And I'd put Nocturnal above him, but I'd, I'd put them both in the middle tier personally. Yeah, well, here's the way we'll go, right? Let's just quickly put some in the middle tier, then discuss okay. further. So, Clavicus Vile. Clavicus Vile. Her scene. Um, yeah, all right, let's put her scene there. Uh, what was the one you said just before? We were Nocturnal. Discussing... Nocturnal. Um, um, some of them, I've really got to, like, check my, like, Dark Elf bias with some of these. Were you thinking like, Mephala really, like... and Azura, maybe? Or, like, one of them? Oh, uh, I... I I, I'm, I'm going to argue, like, we'll, we'll try to a bit more. Because arguably things, the problem, Azura, um, Boethia, and Mephala have a lot of mythology around them. They have, a, they have like, fac so some of them have factions interacted with them. But we have, a because they were the anticipations of um, Almalexia, Sothisil, and Vivek, they just have sort of a lot more mm. to them. Um, but, yeah, I... Yeah, I feel like Mafala is a very me thing, like wanting it to be higher. I could, I or to be honest though, I could put Boethia in middle tier. Yeah, so you'd put Mafala. I mean, this isn't the conversation, but you'd put Mafala at the height of the good Daedra. You'd say she's the best of the three. I think so, but I also really like Azura, mm. Azura as well, because I think she's got an interesting. It, she's kind of interesting within the the Dunma, but also outside of. I think. Um, I personally put Azura at the top of the good Daedra. Of those mm. three, Azura is probably my favorite. Boethi is mine. The, yeah, if anything, I would actually put Mafala at the bottom of the three. For me, it right. goes Azura, Azura Boethia, Mafala. 
to really like throw out there why real quick is for Mafala is because a the Morag Tong and the whole involvement with that also the whole Dark Brotherhood Night Mother sort of theories and all that kind of connection and also the anticipation of Vivek and there's a lot of like cool little interaction and, and cross of themes and stuff that's in there. fair that's so, fair uh, yeah um, Azura we'll, hold on we'll get to this because I feel like a lot of the good yeah let's talk to them together the after but the we'll, middle we'll, tier. Well, let's just... Okay, let's do the first three. Clavicus Vile, her scene in Nocturnal. Let's talk Clavicus Vile first. All right. Coolest thing about him. Umbra, the sword <laughs> he, cre- <laughs> he had created for it. But then... Because a witch made that. Like, Nana were mm-hmm. or something. Or, I forget. But basically... And then Umbra does the whole Umbriel thing. Clavicus Vile is cool. I like the theme. And the, the, the bargains and stuff like that. And also... He's got a little bit more interest because he's kind of w- working against Bar. Well, not against, but like Barbus is trying to rein him in all the yeah. time. And Barbus kind of so, is him. Like they're kind of yeah. two sides of the same coin, so to speak, which I find really cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I guess a, a real middle tier kind of thing. Like, uh, Could I also I've- just say, and I don't know if this is in the lore or not, just off the top of my head, but today I was actually looking at Umbra, the sword, right? And it's a really cool black mm. sword. And then it's like, oh, it was designed with the sole purpose of the entrapment of souls. And then I'm like, it's kind of just like a giant warped black soul gem, if you wanted to look at it like that. Yeah, just, even even in Oblivion, the sort of kind of has a bit of like a crystalline. Yeah, look you know to what it. I mean. Like the blade, it's a. Bit you can of that, really yeah. imagine it's a yeah. sword made of black soul gem stuff, and like. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that's canon. Um, it's just what came to my head when I looked at it today. I was like, oh, hang on, that would make sense. And I mean, if we were to con- to consider the other Daedric artifact too, like the mask of Clavicus Vile has a cool story behind mm-hmm. it, and is also a cool mask. I, yeah. I just, I think. Um, yeah, the other reasons up there. Also, he has uh, the Daedric Realm, Clavicus Files Daedric Realm. I forget what it's called, but I know it's got the Skadarfin and stuff all over, and it's like fertile countryside. This is bugging me a now. Lot of it. I should know what that's called. But, um, I mean, uh, while we look, I think one of the cool things about Clavicus Vile is he, he naturally attracts the coolest stories. Wait, what? what's it called? Fields that's of the, Regret. Yeah. That's a, that's a cool thing, too, like just because like people regretting their bargains with him, mm. you know, and... But I think he naturally has really cool stories associated with him because because of the bargains, he's kind of always putting himself at risk of getting himself into trouble and accidentally giving away his power and things. Because it's like, uh, one way I interpret interpret Clavicus Vial is he's not trying to trap you into, you know, screwing yourself over and giving you his soul all the time. He, he kind of likes people to challenge his wits a bit, not just bootlick and ask for wishes. He, w- he wants to be challenged yeah. and then sometimes, you know, he's, a, he's like a gambler, an, an addicted gambler that he can, he can actually really make a mistake and lose a load of power because he's constantly, you know, yeah, pursuing yeah. with wits, with mortals. I mean, if you, get, if you yeah. get the Winter Sun mod for Skyrim, I highly recommend getting it. You can actually, if you worship him, you get all these different packs that you can kind of pick as challenges that might be like murder five people within one hour and stuff like that, which I think is really cool. I also just wanted to say, because it did sound right but wrong at the same time, um, his, uh, the, his Daedra, the Scarfen, because Scott, you said Skaldarfen, and I'm like, yeah, that's a that's an Elder oh, Scrolls sorry, thing. And I'm like, oh, wait, yeah. that's where you go that's to a ruin, isn't with it? Oda, Odaving, right? Flying on his back. Yeah. You probably said it because I, I said Scarf it to you and... the other day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I meant Scarf and the Daedra. That was yeah, awesome. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, other thing, so, you know, Clavicus File, it says, um, and the weekend stuff, like, finds eternity to be boring and so on. And, and that's another sort of, like, what Drew was talking about, like, like the idea that he gets a kick out of tricking people that are really hard to trick like it's not like it has got to be a bit of like entertainment value you know if it's it's like i said doesn't just want bootlickers but um i can't remember if it's him uh but is he connected with the cyrodiilic vampire order because it says here to he's said uh known to be a patron of vampires gracing them with social stature reason and savvy yeah it sounds it sounds super super familiar doesn't he give them one of his artifacts? The bitter is it the bitter cup? The bitter um, cup is actually I remember the bitter cup. I th- I think he gives that to them, unless I'm I'm mistaking it for a different artifact altogether. But I think it is a different artifact. Just because I've just I've just looked up the bitter cup 
and it says it's just the quest in Morrowind as far as I can right. see. But yeah, I do remember him being involved with vampires in Cyrodiil specifically. Or perhaps it was just a theory people had and it got stuck in my head. Hold on. Wait, no, no, no. Uh, manifesto uh, Cyrodiil Vampirium. Uh, to Kinfather, Merlock Bell, yada, 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 yada. Um, to Patron. To Patron Clavicus Vile, beacon of our affairs. We owe our successes and social stature. Our bond with Vile makes us unique among our kind, for his guidance steals our savage craving with reason and savvy. For him, we live admis- admidst mankind and twist them to our will from offices of power. That's really cool. Epic. So, yeah, I, I mean, but still, I still think solid middle tier, but he does have some cool things going on with Clavicus It's funny, Fly. I actually had him in part of my top tier originally. For all the reasons we've just said, I just personally think he's really cool. I mean, we're allowed yeah. to disagree. I, I, w- I would place him, I mean, I would place him above N- Nocturnal. Well, can see, once we've kind of, um, once we got a bit of a list, we can kind of then like debate some of the yeah, placement. Yeah, sure. Um, but let well let's do nocturnal now. Um, Thieves Guild, Nightingales, Nightingale armor is really cool. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Besides the sort of thief thing, I like you know skeleton key is really really cool as well. Yeah, especially some um, of the more like interesting concepts about the skeleton key unlocking not just doors but places to like other realms so like in theory if you were super powerful you could use the skeleton key to do kind of mankar cameron type stuff like if you were super powerful like unlock doors to special realms and unlock they they also there's also this concept of like unlocking your inner potential as corny as that sounds and getting like powers and and stuff like that as well because well, if you if you're yeah, purely yeah. talking about artifacts, you could argue that she's the best. If you're just talking about artifacts, oh yeah, for sure. But but the, yeah, there's a lot that kind of. I mean, one thing I like about Nocturnal is you kind of get the idea that she, you know she's this edgy emo like Lord of the <laughs> Darkness or whatever. But I, I've always associated her darkness with the shadows. The idea is that her darkness is supposed to be useful. You know, you're not you, you, yeah. you know it's it's for thieves to use. And the other thing is that because her followers are thieves, it's more like they're business associates than actual worshippers or followers. Yeah. And she grants some good luck as well, which is interesting, you know? Like luck as a concept. Mm. Yeah. And her talking ravens and stuff is cool, like her little talking crows and so on. Like, that's just a cool, like, aesthetic thing. Yeah, and the, and the... She also has the most cleavage. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it's good for <laughs> thumbnails. Uh, and the cowl of nocturnal, which we all know is a super super cool thing and the bow of shadows if you remember from morrowind making Mm. you invisible and and having increased speed and stuff like that and that bow has gone between a few different characters uh throughout the elder scrolls timeline i believe that dram is one of them yeah the assassin in Mm. redguard yeah yeah but uh yeah i i guess nocturnal middle tier pretty can pretty confirmed All right, so next one. Uh, let's do her scene. Okay. Her scene. Um, he's really cool. I, I know Drew, you like I love, her scene yeah, quite I love a bit. Her scene. He's yeah, great. Yeah. Um, obviously, he has the whole werebeasts thing going for him. Um, he's also got a whole DLC for himself in Elder Scrolls Three Blood Moon. Uh, we get a decent amount of exposure to him. But... Uh, I don't know. There's, there's cool stuff like Hunter and so on, but you know it's still a kind of a basic theme. Like, it's cool. It's all really cool, but it's nothing... Um, it doesn't really apply to a lot of things outside of that sphere, you know what I mean? Like, it's very just like, oh, Hunters and yeah, the whole... Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, is very important and not super deep, I guess, for lack of better words. I think what I like mm. about her scene is kind of similar to what I like about Clavicus Vile, is that the... You know, the Aedra seem very rigid. They're, they're your gods who you worship. But what I like about the Daedra is their kind of willingness to just play around. It's fun to meddle with the mortal realm. And her scene, like Clavicus Vile, I get the idea that he's not cruel. And he like, if someone is his prey, he's not just going to, like, butcher them for no reason. He likes to have the competition. And the competition, you know, you have to give your prey fair treatment so they they actually have a chance to win 
And I feel like if someone beats him and, you know, takes his hide or whatever, he's actually really happy about it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a good sportsman. Yeah, so that's what I like about him. But then again, he wasn't so happy when Shea Goroth beat him. No, but Shea Goroth's a hack. So, <laughs> you know. It, it kind of reminds me that uh, the story between Shea Goroth and her scene has her scene... Like, they have a battle, I think, of beasts... And her scene mm. has like a big, I think it's a weird day drop. And yeah. Shea Gorath just makes this bird, which just flies around, dodging all the attacks and chirping, basically makes it kill itself, right? One, one yeah. thing that is just a theory o- about that, which I find really cool, is there's this artifact called the Spear of Bitter Mercy. And people say it's forged by Mehrun's Dagon. Some people say it's the signature um, weapon of her scene. But interestingly, I believe in Morrowind, you can get it from a Shea Gorath quest, kind of hinting that perhaps he won the artifact from her scene in that bet. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, in reality, multiple... Because sp- uh, he often has... Um, says little to nothing known about the spear that he... The Spear of Bitter Mercy. Um, in reality, multiple spears exist... And they were said to be forged by Marin's Dagon, yeah. And then at least one of them became the signature of his ally hers. Yeah. Oh yeah. So maybe um maybe there's a few of them and I don't know if like Sheogorath's one is his. It could be easily. Yeah, for sure. I, I just um, heard the theory and I thought it was cool. Like I just think it's one of those things worth yeah. mentioning. Like if they had a bet, often like, you know, usually with bets there's something to win. I remember for writing the Reachman law video there was a really cool uh there was a really cool book and it was about it was just it was just in reference to him and it was talking about all of like her scenes holy aspects and there was all like this there was like the aspect of of the hunter which is sort of him with a spear and then there was like a i'm pretty sure it was like a bear one and i think even a hare like a there's a, there was a, basically a few different things and one of them was like a wear beast or something but there are there are some really cool pieces with her scene her scene doesn't like it's cool because the reachmen are one of the few i think cultures that sort of have him in their like pantheon mm. sort of like otherwise he's usually a select sort of hunters outside thing mm. you know what i mean and he's you know savior's hired it's cool as well i mean he's in killing a unicorn yeah. was he's fun. in the khajiit and bosma kind of um worship yeah true more, sorry yeah more often yeah but yeah, I, th- I think he's a, he's a pretty firm middle tier, despite. Yeah. And he, I mean, he's got a sick aesthetic appeal. Um, like, I, I just think like that. I prefer there's, there's depictions of him in ESO with like a proper deer's head, but I do like the bone deer head mm. better. I think. But um, yeah. So her scene there. All right, let's. So what else have we got? Is, Would- what about Hermaeus Mora? Let's actually discuss Hermaeus Mora. Because I like, do you think he's a top or a mid or a? I feel like you if reckon? you're bringing his um, realm of oblivion into it, he would be right up the top. Yeah, I mean that's fair. You can bring it in. I mean, you also get a lot of interaction with mm. him, um, and knowledge is really cool. Yeah, <laughs> like, um, but yeah, I, I personally, I don't I'd know, put him top tier. I think and black books and stuff. Yeah, it's cool. I guess I, I guess maybe I'm just sort of like bored mm-hmm, of him. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. But I, I kind of I do. He probably belongs there. So yeah. What else I'm have not, we got? What What do we reckon? I was just gonna Sorry. say yeah. Like the Ogmer Infinium, super cool. Like all the Black Book mm. powers are super cool. The concept that he doesn't actually create really any knowledge. He just kind of steals it all and hoards it for himself. And you know you can go to his realm and unlock all these different secrets so much as you don't go insane. He's also a connoisseur well, of Japanese media. <laughs> <laughs> Let's discuss Boethia then. Let's discuss Boethia because Drew, make make your case for putting him in the top tier versus middle. Well, I think. I mean, I kind of I'm biased because I like all of anything Dunma related, and Boethia is hugely important to to Veloth and, and all that. I really. It's hard for me to, to, to sort of tear up the, the good Daedra. Mm. Well, I mean, so. I'll have to like double check with the texts and you might be able to tell me if I get anything wrong here. But I feel like of the good Daedra, when the Kaima first became the changed ones and moved to Morrowind or Resdane, as it was called then, Boethia was 
behind most of it. He was the like the kind of catalyst for the change. The the Azura and Mafala yeah. were involved. Like Azura, I think helped them build their homes. I, I hope I'm not getting that bit wrong, but I think or was that Boethia? Um, I think it was. Uh, I think it's sometimes there is a bit of a weird stuff. I think it's both Mafala and Boethia in different instances are credited with the formation of the great houses. Mm-hmm. Though I think it is. I, think it I, I would give I would uh, give credit to Azura's Mafala anyway. Was, I think Azura was behind the, the like the idea of the changed ones, the Kaima, the thing. Right. Well, I mean, uh, they're kind this, of this is kind of I guess I'm um, bringing s- subjective ideas into it, but I think I'd associate their political formation with Mafala because the idea of lies and deception is your way to get the political upper hand. I associate that with Mafala. I associate with Boethia the idea of changing because. Um, I mean, obviously, Boethia is the one who shamed Tri- uh, shamed Trinimac, but then also Boethia kind of gives them the idea that, um, you, which is at the foundation of Dunmer and Kaima people, is that the uh, mortality is a test. So it's all about getting good and overcoming it and kind of reaching apotheosis by beating mortality, essentially. Well, I could throw in this for you is um, they do, it was the, that... Um... They believe Azura is their god ancestor who taught the Kaima how to be different from the Ultima, though some of those can be attributed to Boethia and other texts and so on. I feel like it's a mm. bit of a communal job with that, like they're all um, doing it. But um, obviously Azura plays a bigger part with the Nerevarine stuff, but that kind of that's like later in the history. Um, I mean, Boethia does have a golden katana, which is uh, pretty cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> gold brand is yeah. cool. Um, there's also Fear Struck, which was this shield that you hardly know anything about. Yeah, there's a cool mod yeah, for it. <laughs> we know, I think it was yeah. destroyed. Uh, it was like Lyrissius' shield destroyed or melted instantly when fighting a dragon or something. And then uh, he convinced the dragon like to let him polish one of the scales it couldn't reach and then like stabbed it. Yeah, I, you know what? I kind of think as a little exercise to sort of uh, I guess that's unfair though then uh, that would knock out Mafala too but like wh- how is Boethia outside of the Dark Elf stuff I mean she created the orc okay, it's pretty pretty um, important in t- the created the orcs really inadvertently like by consuming Trinimac and pooping him out and that you know some say that's a super literal take but it's my take I yeah it's, it. it's juicy <laughs> it's fruity it's interesting uh, yeah um well, a lot of Boethia yeah. is just enjoying watching mortals fight to the death and then choosing the most powerful mortal to be her champion oh. or his champion. Ebony Mail, too, is really cool. I, I like, actually, one thing that makes Boethia more interesting is I like that in that whole Trinimax story, um, she's kind of, like, defending Lorcan's honor, like, sort of seems to like Lorcan and, like, be... Um, and that's one of the reasons for um, screwing over Trinimac because of the watch i think i can't remember the quote exactly but it's something along the lines of um the lies that trinamac was spreading about Lorcan. something like that yeah Do you i'm remember pretty that? sure i'm gonna see if i can pull I up the remember. source but um yeah i mean I, as the no, listeners I think can tell you... there is a ton of lore with the three good daedra of the dunma there, there's just a lot of stuff yeah if you think um a but if you think in Oblivion, like if you would actually like break down the quests, for example, in Oblivion and even Skyrim, they're not that crazy good. Like go into an arena, fight a bunch of people, mm. you know, go kill this wood elf dude in in um, in the Ebony Mail. I don't know. Yeah, well, so in the Changed Ones, Boethia specifically says the Ultima were taking the missing god, aka Lorcan's name in vain. Um, and then, if, I mean, if you're looking at just that source because it's talking about Boethia, it kind of gives Boethia all the credit. So it's like, you know, told the mass, the mass of people gathered, the triangle truth, the rule of Sigic Endeavor, how to build houses, how to change your skin, how to achieve Exodus. All of this kind of gets directly attributed to Boethia, but it's obviously, as you've already said, kind of, it's an effort, it's the combined efforts of all of them. Has some cool Khajiit um, lore too, which is. I'm actually less familiar with, um, but I love the uh, Boethra, 
warrior of the east and west i love that sharp-tongued kajiti deity and ancestor spirit and teacher of old ways she is the mate of mafala um but uh additionally kajit will not speak her name on the nights of the ghost moon nights in which it is said boethra wears the death shroud of lorcage and wages war beyond the lattice lattice uh, hmm. the, the good old that's luna cool. lettuce every <laughs> yeah. time I, I read that that's what i read i've actually really got it because that's the newest elsewhere eso sort of stuff um Got to really look into that. I reckon we should make a video on that, do a bit of research. But actually, there's a lot of cool Oh, there's, um, there's heaps of stuff there with like the Daedra and different interpretations, 100%. Yeah. But still, I, I, I'm i struggling. Like, I mean, it's cool to put them in the top. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't know. I just yeah. feel... It gets hazier to towards the top. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yeah. chuck Boethia in the middle tier. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry, let, let, let's Drew. just do that for now. <laughs> Can I, so, can I have a super subjective one, which you guys will, will do a good job of saying how cool he is. But for me, yeah. subjectively, in terms of, you know, what gets me going, I find Molag Bao to be middle tier. Even though there's like all the interesting stuff, I just... I, I, I find him I actually a little bit, probably because of Elder Scrolls Online, but a bit typical, like... I'm evil, I dominate, I'm bad, I'm here with my my dark anchors and my, you know, necromancer yeah. helpers, like, whoa. Vampires, the vampire whole thing yeah, is it cool, is, but it is. like, it's still a solid middle tier outside of that. He's, he's um, I guess what I would say is more like Bal is um, one dimensional. Mm. He's rather very clear intent, purpose, domination, that's my thing. And then it's kind of like applied to everything, but it doesn't, do you want to mean like some of the other ones? I mean, some that we've even put in the bottom tier have a little bit more of a diverse character. Yeah. There's like bits But more to like them. Bale is still like, pretty cool. Like there is a ton of info, especially because of Elder Scrolls <laughs> Online added to him. But yeah, I, I just wanted to come out, break the ice and say, I think Molag like Bale belongs in the middle See, tier. F- funnily enough, and I, and I think Drew will think this is really cool because I actually used to think it was more typical, Mehrin's Dagon. But when you look into Mehrin's yeah. Dagon... He's really, really, really cool. And I, I thought you were about to say mm-hmm. Marin's Dagon, so I was geared up, ready to go, like, yeah, let's go Marin's Dagon. And it's like, no, my like, it's like, yeah, I kind of agree. Well, it automatically um, weakens a prince just to have them fail to invade Tamriel because Mo like Bao being defeated by the the Vestige, I think is the name of the protagonist in yeah. ESO, in, inherently is going to make him seem less powerful and less cool. I mean, you know, he's the prince of domination, but he got beaten in a 1v1 although i think he had a few other people helping but still you know he lost so he can't be that good yeah and, and that differs to mayroon's dagon uh because if you really dive into mayroon's dagon being about revolution and change him invading in the oblivion crisis changed everything yeah so in a way even though he lost he actually kind of won uh, mm. Which compared to Molag Bao, you can't say the same thing because Molag Bao wanted to win, to dominate, to be in control. Mm. Like it's kind of a different theme. Yeah, we've got a video on the channel that compares both of the invasions, and that's that's. I mean, I don't want to spoil it, but it kind of comes down to that. That Mayron's Dagon, so long as he incites change, he he can't really lose. Plus, he came a lot his, closer anyway. His his overall sphere has more character to it. There's different things. Like it's not just the destruction, but the the whole revolution mm. thing is is a really vital component of him. But let's um so basically I think we've got five more. Um we can put another one in the middle tier if you want, or we could just kind of like settle it. Does this well let's just say let's list off the last ones remaining and say, does this sound top tier or would you put one in the bottom? So Azura, Hermeus Mora, Mayrun's Dagon, Mafala and Sheogorath. I think that's a fair top five. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Fair top five? Yeah, especially when you can sell me on Mafala better than I can sell myself. So that's why I I, I agree after hearing, because there's parts you forget, like especially when you talk about like Vivek and stuff, it gets gets more interesting. Yeah. All right, let's um, let's make sure we've kind of, we'll, we'll go into these a bit more. Um, and make sure we've got... Uh, well, let's start with Mayrin's nice. Dagon. That's a that's a top tier kind of one. Yeah, okay. So, um, the, we've had a lot of exposure. Um, 
I mean, I've never personally played Battle Spy, but I get the, the, the gist of it. But um, and obviously Obliv Oblivion as well. Um, and you've got all the Mythic Dawn commentaries, which adds heaps to yeah. them. The whole, um, the whole magni the whole idea that he's birthed in League, but and created by the Magni Gi first as a um, as his being of like hope and revolution. And I'm pretty sure. Um, Drew, correct me if I'm wrong. It's to overthrow the um, Dreg tyrants at that yeah. time, and that's what he was designed with. He's kind of almost like a super weapony kind of vibe thing. Do you, you elaborate? More well, I mean, what, I think one of the coolest things about Marin's Dagon is the idea that he's at one point in time he can be, you know, your worst enemy, um, and then he's your best friend. It's all about who. He kind of he represents the bottom. Whoever's on the bottom, he's the perfect tool to kind of just. I mean, really, he's kind of the the communist revolution um, <laughs> prince because the idea is whoever's suffering or whoever wants to just topple what exists, call on Mayrun's Dagon because he's all about you know the hope of the 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 downtrodden and you, you know so. And that's what kind of like makes him interesting that he can sort of it's kind of the underdog kind of thing in the revolution. Like, but he can be, you know, your enemy or your best friend, but like from some perspectives, if you didn't like the empire and you didn't like the current sort of go with Tamriel and the time of the oblivion crisis, then he's appealing. And that's how all those mythic dawn came about. Cause they were promised sort of like this new realm where he combines them. And like, I'll, I'll read the, it's the mythic dawn commentaries for, I'll try and get through, um, Mundex, uh, Mundex Turin, which, um, is referring to Mundus, I'm mm -hmm. assuming, was once ruled over solely by tyrant dreg kings, each to their own dominion and border wars fought beneath, uh, between their slave oceans. They were akin to the time totems of old, yet evil and full of mockery and profane powers. No one that lived did so outside of the sufferance of the dregs. Um, give my soul to the Magna Gi, saith... Okay, hold on, I'll... I'll basically, Mayrun's... For they created Mayrunes the razor in secret in the very bowels of Lig, the domain of the upstart who vanishes. Yeah, and um, though they came from diverse waters, each get shared sole purpose to artifice a prince of good, spinning his likeness in random swath and imbuing him with oblivion's most precious and scarce asset, hope. <laughs> and then there's a bunch of other stuff, but basically it's a cool... So... Um, uh, a great rebellion rose up and pulled down the towers of Kim El Garjig, and the Templars of the Upstart were slaughtered. Look, there's a lot of poetic stuff here, but essentially he rose up and helped um, depose the Dreg Kings. And that I like too that 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 those tyrant Dreg Kings are referenced in the 36 Lessons of Vivek as well, in all of the Dunma mythology as mm. well, like separate. So. It kind of, to me, it kind of um, leads me to believe that there were these tyrant dreg kings of League and stuff like that. But the other thing that really sells me on Mayrin's Dagon is in the Dunma mythology, he's one of the four corners of the House of Troubles. And there's just cool, like he embodies all of... So the four corners of the House of Troubles are Malakath, Mayrin's Dagon, Molag, Bal, and Sheogorath. And each of them represent sort of trials or challenges so Molag Bal is always looking out to like corrupt the Dunma bloodlines like vampirism etc etc um Sheogorath's trying to turn them all insane and, and challenging the mind uh, Malakath is uh the physical test like sending the orcs and all that kind of stuff and then Mayron's Dagon sort of like the the terrain the inhospitable terrain of of uh, Morrowind and that's kind of what he represents but there's this really cool story where Vivek is in his giant form and he's fighting Mayrun's Dagon and they're having this big clash and their their battles actually create Oh stop hold on wait I'm just making sure I'm not confusing the West Gash that might be um the ruddy man actually but regardless I was just about to he, bring him up um yeah. to go back to Molag Bal very briefly but go on Yeah um so ba basically Mayrun's Dagon has a big fight and I remember that he was he disarmed Mayrun's Dagon or something and then Vivek um, basically waited for him to get his sword back or basically did this chivalrous act because he didn't want to fight an unarmed opponent. Um, and then that's why the Dramora um, of Meryn's Dagon and so forever actually honoured um, Vivek because of because the chivalry that he showed off and so on. But Meryn's Dagon's involved in a bunch of... Are you of talking about the destruction of Mournhold? 
Well, that's no, that's okay. separate. That's when, that's when, yeah, Mayron's Dagon gets summoned up and he destroys Mournhold mm. once, but then so the Sil and Almalexia stop him. Yeah. But that's a separate one. But to, to quickly talk about the Ruddy Man, um, that's another cool Molag Bell story. I still think he's middle tier, but to a little bit more um, development is um, Molag Bell was said to be the king the, of the, the chief, dregs. The chief of the kings. The chief yeah. of the dregs. Um, and he was... He was can't remember if he was killed in a battle or, or something went down, but basically his carapace um, fell when he was killed as the king chief of the drags. His carapace fell down on, onto the land and so on. And a Dunma boy came along and found the carapace and wore it. But then that turned him into the ruddy man, which is this like big, terrible monster beast and so on. And I'm pretty sure. And then he had a fight with Vivek and Vivek beat him, but it created the West Gash, which is an area of Vardenfell. And um, and basically that even there apparently like today you can hear like the the sounds of, of Vex blade scraping against the chitinous carapace of the ruddy man and and in the ESO Morrowind DLC there was um, uh, I think it was called the ruddy broodmother or something like that just another sort of connection there but Merlock Bell has cool stuff too but I still think Merrin's Dagon his whole Mythic Dawn like getting into the Mythic Dawn cult stuff. Um, is is really cool and it reveals a lot more about him. It makes him more um, two dimensional rather than just destruction. Three dimensional, yeah. <laughs> Three dimensional. So that's what and, I mean. And he yeah. has all these really cool artifacts as well. Like besides Mayrune's razor, there's things like the Daedric Crescent, um, the Spear of Bitter mm. Mercy, depending on who you listen to. But there's also uh, the Sword of the Moon Reaver, which was actually given to his bodyguard and also kind of his lover he took one of the dark seducers as his lover yeah um, back in battle spire so this is about and even to just add on that battle spire stuff too is like this in that time he was helping um jagar tharn with, with that whole like getting the throne like for the events of arena like battle spires around then but um yeah it's just cool like and that's another sort of form of revolution like he really tries and screws the empire twice in like the third um in the third era yeah. but yeah he's got um and also there's the mysterium zarks yeah. he's tome written yeah. by him who scribed it in the deserts of rust and wounds yeah which is the deserts cool right st- yeah i'm pretty sure yeah all right but uh yeah i think he's he's not the top but he's definitely in the top tier he's not like the best but i i reckon yeah, we, we don't need to order them perfectly. I feel like once we get to the top three, so if we have to have like kind of a top three out of the top tier to really discuss, what would we um, what would we do for the next one? So you kind of have um, Hermaeus Mora, Azura, um, Mafala, and Sheagora. Do, do you want Do you want to get the big one out of the room? Because I kind of <laughs> want to talk about it. But like, I think. Sheogorath's really cool, but he's overrated. I really like... I, I is not my subjective top, and I know he's heaps of people's favorite, but just to give my case, I think Sheogorath himself, he's cooler in the stories, but a lot of him is meme value. It's like, oh, I'm so crazy. Ha ha, cheese. Oh, it's so crazy. And a lot of like why I love the Shivering Isles isn't because of Sheogorath. It's because of his realm and the people in his realm. It's not so much him specifically he's got some cool stories and stuff um i i I, i'm not as well read on um his involvement in daggerfall which was also interesting because he was kind of tied up in the main um quest line a little bit but still i just i i just think especially considering his fourth era show like it's cool that the champion of cyrodiil mantles him and kind of becomes him but i feel like kind of like jigalag he's to me at least he's become more boring now that he's not I liked his third era sort of incarnation when he was sort of alternating with Jigalag versus him now as his separate. I don't know. I just, sometimes I get bored of the, oh, I'm crazy. Yeah, I I feel like it could also be one of those things where he's become so mainstream and so commonplace. And, Mm. you know, the fact that he has all these memes is because he's good, not people think he's good because of the memes, if that makes sense. Like it all started in the fact that he's a very captivating character. And to be mm. fair as well, his realm kind of is him. 
and when when we're yeah. when we're ranking all of the other daedra on this list we're not saying oh you know i think uh malakath is a really interesting individual but i don't know about the rest of it like it's always looking at uh the, the yeah the, yeah because they everything. don't have particularly interesting personalities they often just have a big and reverb voice coming out of a statue um yeah and it's where he gets a big edge because obviously there was one of the best dlcs of all time <laughs> is his yeah. realm and he has the wabberjack and he, you know and even like his whole um dynamic with haskell and stuff like that and just the kind of lore of the shivering isles in the world it, it adds a lot more character to 100 so for me i would rank him at the absolute top because of his realm because of the Shivering Isles and everything mm. in it. It's, it's all subjective. That's why I would chuck him up the top. I also love all of his uh, artifacts and stuff. Not necessarily like one in particular, but just that he has a bunch. Like it's not just Wabberjack, the random staff, uh, but there's also like, the I mean, yeah, the Fork of Horripilation, Horip but there's also the um, Folium Discognitum, which is like another Daedric artifact tome with like words in it that, move around when you try and look at them so it's like basically incomprehensible but if you can figure it out like you get like power and stuff like that um there's the stuff of the ever scamp is kind of just like a troll artifact i guess i'm really tempted to put him in the top three at least though otherwise i'm just gonna be like all the comments are gonna be like scott you're such a dumb weeaboo <laughs> what like how is he worse and than he's the skooma cat he's the skooma cat in in elder scrolls online yeah Look, how about we? I'll, I'll de default. He's not. He's not like the fourth. Let, let's at least. He's talk. top three. Let, I have. A, what do you think about um, Azura? I just find Azura super wholesome and interesting, and I really like the whole idea that's mixed in that you don't often hear about, but of vanity, and how and how yeah. kind of Azura's even been said to like kind of bewitch some of her followers into loving her so much, and that that's kind of not that she's like well i guess you could say insecure but like she has a big ego and rewards worshippers who play into her ego and stuff mm. yeah that's and obviously she is um paramount to the whole nerevarine prophecy yeah. and and all of that um and she's so involved in in all of that and but it's kind of like you know the one the, she you know she she can be a uh, a bit rude sometimes. I think she's over the one time personally. Sothis Sothisil gave her the finger and um and then she turned an entire race into the dark. Elves. Well I've got a quote here that I used in the Azura video that was Vanity yeah. well fed is benevolent, vanity hungry is spiteful. And that kind of sums yeah. her up perfectly. But there's also a story of the Dwemer essentially tricking her. Uh, there was a, a Dwemer like... Uh, Azura and the boss. Yeah, so I can't... What exactly happened? Can you remember exactly what happened in that? I can't... Ba I can't basically, it's, it's... it was along the lines of um, she wrongly predicted what was in the box as, and that was the Dwemer way of showing that she wasn't as powerful as she thought she was or something. And, yeah. and she really disliked being deceived like that. Mm. Um, I, I, to, to be honest, I ref reckon we could put Azura yeah, below. Me, I would. Me, me too. Yeah, me too. I, I mean, I would well, have put her in middle tier personally, but you, you could. But There's an argument there. It's more like, I guess, her concept is not top tier. If that makes sense, like just her I, I theme like... and vibe is doesn't jump out as super amazing. It's all of the the little stuff and the stories and that. I, I feel like I'm conflating her a lot with her yeah. followers. Like Indor and Erevaz, he's yeah. cool to me and he's champion of Azura, but he's not really like embodying what azura is and so if same sense, i think like... i think i'm doing something similar the more i think about it the more i'm drifting towards drew's view actually <laughs> which do you know what i i think i think we should probably if anything if we were to make a little swap i reckon maybe even swap azura and boethia so boethia from middle Ooh. tier and a boethia into so we're gonna put azura yeah. in the middle tier i can i mean i can one thing i can vibe that i mean we don't want to be simps we're not uh <laughs> tricked by her endowed features i mean how yeah. how impressive of a feat is changing their skin color like how often do daedra princes have that much of an effect over mortals is there much i mean evidence? she's also she's all, the other thing called the change she's also attributed to changing i'm pretty sure changing the khajiit from elves into yeah little cat people. yeah made them the fastest the cleverest so that's kind of cool like she's changing all of these races and transforming which i don't them. think other daedric princes really do so, you know, I'm kind of 
playing devil's advocate contrarian against yeah. myself here but <laughs> she's actually pretty <laughs> pretty good okay okay maybe we can put azura in the top tier but like at the bottom of the top tier like so there's six in the top tier now do, do you know how i i kind of feel like actually maybe putting let's make the top tier just four Ooh, okay and just just put Bowie Theory into the middle uh, middle With tier Azura. as well. Because when I was thinking, I'm like, maybe I'm just swapping it, but maybe they're kind of on the same. Although we need to discuss Mafala, because like I guess um, I feel like that's just my uh, my my subjective. I mean, we've all got to, it's all subjective, but we're trying to like make it uh, into a thing. But yeah, my main reason for um, Mafala is. Basically, she sets the foundation through the Morag Tong, sets the foundation of a peaceful Dunma society, which I really like. Which is basically giving it's the whole idea of that alt alternative society that you've got where, where the Morag Tong are doing these li licensed murders and so on. It, it allows them to just it's like that sort of you know the themes of how like a society is you know super great and everything but you know secretly the cia are off assassinating things and doing all kinds of things there's lots of dark and evil stuff happens to maintain a pleasant good society it's kind of her and the morag tong is what they they have to do to maintain so there isn't all-out warfare and so on and i love um i'll have to find some of my favorite quotes i love what's a fair I mean, you can kind of associate all deception with Mafala, and lying and deception is pretty powerful. Yeah. And I love the idea too. I love the whole the idea of that all mortal lives are on threads, and so on. And she's like the web spinner, like you know, plucking threads and doing all kinds of stuff. And 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 she's also associated with fate and stuff. And because of that, she's said to be the sibling of Hermaeus Mora, which is really cool as well. Um, but. I'm just trying to find my favorite. There's a quote. Yeah, I just like... So, you know, as known in the West, Mafala is the demon of murder, sex, and secrets. But all of these themes contain um, subtle aspects and violent ones. So there's like assassination and genocide, but then there's like courtship and then there's like orgy or like tact or poetic truths. And just sort of like this kind of... She paradoxically sort of contains all of these kind of themes do you know what i mean and then also it's kind of that her whole thing by being the anticipation of vivek she's she's very important to vivek's character as well because mafala is like the, the the primal darker side well in their canon in their um theology she's the sort of darker part of vivek it's it's um, funny because to me i just can't she just doesn't click with me. Like, I can't say that, oh, I like Mafala a lot more than Boethia and Azura. I, mm. I can't have her I top tier I think and it's have the other two middle tier. The other thing too, is I think is, is the, um, uh, the Morag Tong thing. Like, I really like the idea with that when the armistice happened, that they had to, uh, sorry, not the armistice. Um, they when the rise of the tribunal they had to sort of start worshiping vivek oh, maybe it was the armistice i can't remember basically there's a thing that basically she deceived and became like the night mother and then created this whole like dark brotherhood thing invertedly with um well sorry directly um because the original morag tong had sort of strayed uh for the part well yeah, there's stuff there. I feel like I'm not selling no, it. No, you're not. Well, there's, there's the argument. <laughs> no, there's I'm the not. argument that night that the night mother is literally just an aspect of Mafala. So she is the yeah. wife of Sifis. Yeah. Oh, the ebony blade's sick as well, <laughs> and the spider Daedra and the spiders and all that kind of stuff. But um, I might be giving her too much credit, but I I kind of associate all uh, manipulation to Mafala. So anytime mortals are manipulating one another lying to another, uh, deceiving or assassinating, all of the, the butterfly effects that happen from someone being assassinated or deceived is kind of her at work. Yeah, I, I also really like um, that... Oh, also, I don't know, this is only just based off... Um, I'll just find the exact source. Um, in the monomyth... Um, 
Apparently she's recognized as one of the strongest and recognizable spirits that emerged soon after Akatosh formed and time began. But um, that's, yeah, so she's basically responsible, along with Boethia, but for the foundation of Morrowind. Um, she taught the kind of the skills they would need to evade their enemies or kill them with secret murder. Enemies were numerous in those days because the Kaima were a small faction. Mephala, along with Boethia, organized the clan systems that eventually became the basis for the Great Houses. I also like to the Khajiit that she's the clan mother of dark secrets and the recorder of hidden guilt and eternal Ooh. shame. Um, she's the... Uh, but apparently she fell out of favor during an event known as the Sinner Suicides. But I think that's just from a loading screen, so it's not um, talked about a lot. But I, do, I like... I like the, I really like the secrets and lies and betrayal element of her. And I like that like extra part of hidden guilt and eternal shame. But I like how she kind of encapsulates like the darker parts of a society and so on. And all of those kinds of things. Like, you know, even like, but when betrayal's happening and so on, you could connect it to the whole Arcturian heresy with um, Tiber Septum and so on and his kind of devious kind of i don't know i, I just think she's got a lot i know of i know what you mean stuff, like the, the kind of darker parts yeah. of society that help things run it's it's kind of like the i don't know if anyone listening has seen big mouth but it's like the shame wizard you know it's it's like it's like this yeah. concept that um keeps things you know running smoothly because without that kind of guilt i suppose people would do all kinds of chaotic things yeah um she was also in ESO Somerset, but I'm not... Um, but she got screwed over. Okay, okay. So I think top tier then, but, if we had a top four, we could put Shea Gorath, Emmaus Mora, Mayrunes Dagon, and Mephala in it. Um, yeah, I feel like... I feel like... Both, like we Okay, look, we definitely I don't know, I feel know like, the top tier, that there's a top three then of Shea Gorath, Emmaus like, Mora, and Mayrunes Dagon. That would be my top three. And then I'd maybe, maybe put the good Daedra together after that. Yeah. I, I'm vibing that a lot. I feel, I feel, I feel like that's uh, fair. I feel like I've just crammed Mafala in there because I really. Yeah, like no, I, I think that's. I think that's that's a fair point, Mafala. I'd put Mafala up pretty high as well. Okay. Well, then, then what we can do is so yeah, so yeah, so the good Daedra following Marin's Dagon, Sheogorath, and Hermaeus Mora. Oh, the three that we've seen the yeah, most yeah, of. <laughs> which which like, would you rank the second and third? If we were to rank... Oh, are we just not going to? I guess let's just have some personal rankings. I would probably put Shea Gorath first. Then if I had to pick between... <laughs> yes, yeah, suck it. <laughs> meme value. And then yeah, second and third. I can't help but put Mehrun's Dagon second. I know it feels so typical, but I just really like the Mythic Dawn. And then I'm going to put Hermaeus Mora third. What about you, Drew? I would do um, Shagora third. I mean, the, my favorite isn't involved here because I don't think any of these are my favorites, but I'm kind of looking at it not through my own eyes, basically, but more kind of trying to look at it slightly more objectively. But then I'd put... I think I'd put Hermaeus Mora second and Marin's Dagon first. Right. And what what would you put first if it was... Because we are doing the coolest. Uh, what's coolest to you first? Oh. Number one. That, per that's Periite. Re <laughs> that's really difficult. It's de it's not Periite. No. Um, it also depends the mood yeah. you're in. Like, I know, like, sometimes I have... Like, sometimes I vibe Namira heaps. But, like, it just depends on the mood. But I guess... Yeah. I mean, really, to me, honestly, my favorite isn't even exactly this because it would be more along the lines of i'd probably just put the good danger at the top like i don't know mm. like i really like them and their their thing but um i mean i do like i would i think i might even put Marin's dagon first um if it was me out of these three i wouldn't i guess sheogorath second then hermaeus mora like i don't hate like i definitely don't hate sheogorath that's it's it's funny to say it but I, just... I mean, one thing that you kind of touched on with the cheese meme about Shea Goroth is that when he's portrayed in Oblivion, you really don't see one whole side of him. Even when he's being threatening, it, do it never really feels dangerous. Whereas I got the vibe from the 16 Accords of Madness that he could be really unhinged, like terrifying unhinged. Whereas you don't yeah. really see his full mental illness. You kind of more just he, see he is him. like a bit more. He, he's, he's a great like a leprechaun type. Like, you know, he's he's just not. I don't think he was portrayed as well as he could be, but he was portrayed as well as you'd want for like 
the mainstream appeal. You don't want him to be kind depressive. Like, yeah, he's a bit more palatable, mm. yeah. I guess. For, All right, yeah. so I'm going to read my list from top to bottom to finish up. And this is... It's always subject to change. Like, I've made lists like this before. Someone will comment below, actually, how could you think this one's cooler than this one? I would put this one above this one for sure. And I would read it and just be like, yeah, I agree. But so far, the piece of paper in front of me, Shea Gorath, Mehrunes Dagon, Hermaeus Mora, The Good Daedra, then middle tier, Clavicus Vile, Nocturnal, Hercene, and Molag Bao, bottom tier, Sanguine, Vaimina, Namira, Malakath, Meridia, Periite, and Jigalag. Yeah, my, I mean, mine really only, like, I would just get called a Dunmophile because <laughs> I just, I would just put the good data yeah. at the top. But like, if I'm actually trying, if we're trying to have like a more of a fudge Muppet list, I would, I, I just can't put Shagor at the top <laughs> for me, bro. I just can't. Mayrun's Dagon, I think, because Hermaeus Moore is like, yeah, cool knowledge and tentacles and he's got the Seekers are really cool. Ogmophinium's all really cool. But I just think that Mayrun's Dagon has like cooler interactions in history. Hermaeus Mora kind of doesn't. He has some with like being like known as the Woodland Man, um, and connected to some sort of Atmoran stuff. Is it, that's pretty cool. But I don't know, man. It's ranking. This is so hard. Imagine giving them an uh, everyone. You've just watched an hour or so, or whatever. This podcast. Here's the unsatisfying answer. It's all subjective, man. Like we've all got different days. So I, I think Hermaeus Mora would be the best if his knowledge was more useful, more viable. You know, people who've tried to access his knowledge tend to get screwed over for um, it. There's there's not a great deal of value for mortals in it. Um, whereas I think Mehrunes Dagon is the best because, I mean, obviously he's really interesting with how he's been portrayed in the games, but also I think he's the most valuable to mortals. So one thing I'd say about Marion's Dagon, which I can't say for anyone else, is there's never, ever going to be a time where people aren't worshipping him. Because, for example, if I just use the dregs as an example, Marion's Dagon was arguably created to take down the dreg kings. Whereas if you look at the dreg now, you can argue that the seaborn ones are still intelligent, but they, they, you know, they get fished to death. And when they come on land, they're just mad. Whereas... Um, so they're now downcast and they have a re they could potentially start worshipping Merun's Dagon because they want revolution or something. So there's always going to be people who want liberation or re uh, revolution because, you know, what's destruction to the Empire is liberation to someone else, you know. Mm. So I think Merun's Dagon is the best because he's the most valuable. Is yeah, how I and... Um... Yeah, and I mean, he's also the most intimately connected with the entire theme of Oblivion, which is like chaos and change. So by revolution being like a, you know... And I mean, if you take outside of the typical kind of stuff, like the Deadlands is a pretty sick looking place. Like I remember playing it back in the day, Oblivion, like oh, I'm in a demon realm. It's the most like... Yeah, but, but you know if... You I mean? uh, And a If you reflect on well. it though, it's also kind of a boring realm. In, in, just in the sense that mm. it is just typical... If you, if you know what I mean, it, you would never say it's like, yeah. oh, that's a really unique demon realm. It, it's, it's, it yeah, is the it's demon realm. Smoke. It's fire and demons. Yeah. And, uh, but like you always doom. take it with a grain of salt, right? Because, I mean, yeah, Boethia's realm is portrayed as basically the Deadlands as well. So oh, that, it's, that, it's yeah. not, but that's the way it is in that, in that game. So I kind of... It's the same when we were talking about Meridia's colored rooms. You know, you can see how it's portrayed in ESO. But I kind of just... Because it's Oblivion, I just read it as, oh, this is how it's portrayed right now, but it's completely subject to change. And I still see it as like a, you know, a realm of reflected light or whatever else. Yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah. I, I get like, what, what's the top? What, what's the top one that, like, Michaels, you said, you said Shea. I have Mayrun's Day as a close second. Like, you can, you can, I would say Mayrun's. It's only because. Uh, the Shivering Isles realm, if you just looked at them as individuals, I would agree with Mehrun's Dagon and the concept of Dagon in general. It's only because uh, Shea Gorath has the Shivering Isles realm, which is part of him and everything in it, it's super interesting, and how it, his interactions with Jigalag is making me put him at the top. But it depends when, but if I was going fourth era... He no longer has the connection to Jigalag to and the Jigalag and the Grey March is kind of all not a thing anymore because they're completely separate entities. And then I well, kind of like, free now, isn't he? Yeah, so he's he free. could be the current. Because Shale Gorath, 
Because because before, at least the way I understand it, is that that Sheogorath was never a thing. He was the curse of Jiglag. He's like the nuts part of Jiglag. But what happened is that nuts part was then mantled by the champion of Cyrodiil separately, and then you have Jiglag is now free. I'm um, but I don't know. I I would I would I like the Shivering Isles is the big part, obviously that pushes him up, but. I don't know. I, I just sort of, I even think like the whole cult, like the mythic dawn and their armor and stuff and their whole, like all of their philosophy, their book and Menkar Cameron's such a cool dude. Like they're not directly him, but you yeah, know what and, I mean? And Gaia like, Alata. And, and I like the fact that uh, different people in Cyrodiil, when you're playing Oblivion can secretly be Mehrun's Dagon followers and that yeah. they'll actually summon the mythic dawn armor set. If you attack them in the middle of Skingrad, for example, or you're hostile, they'll if just we chuck would, it on. If we're to give people a satisfying answer, I think, Drew, you're going to have to be, like, the the decider here of the number one. I think Meryn Stagon is number one. Meryn Stagon. And I, I would say Shogorath second. It's Shogorath over Hermes Mora, I yeah, me too. say. And you'd say. So then that's two against one for Shogorath for <laughs> second. And then Hermes Mora third. We all yep, agree I, there. I'm, I'm in agreement with the list, man. I, I It's just yeah. if you include realms... If I mean, oh, for sure. Although one change, sure. I'd put Periite just above Mehrun's Dagon. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, the yeah. last change, though. Who, uh, l- last thing, we've we'll, we'll got to wrap this up, but who, who is your absolute subjective, like at least most interested in? Even if current? I had to lean, I'd lean towards Malakath. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. But I, I like her scene, I like Sanguine, and I like Periite as well. So. And Clavicus Vile. So pretty much the weak ones. All right. Wait, here's a more fun question. Favorite of the bottom tier, and then we'll and then we'll end the episode. Remind me of the bottom tier. I think my- Sanguine, Vaimina, Namira, Malakath, Meridia, Periite, or Jigalag. I don't know if I can come up with a straight answer, but mine would either be, I think, Namira or Meridia. Meridia because of all the mm. Aelid involvement and stuff like that. I would probably actually go Meridia. But Namira is a close second out of that bottom tier. But yeah, what about you, Mark? Oh, this sounds like such a meme because it's been the joke, but I would almost say Perry. <laughs> just <laughs> just yeah. hear me out. I'm convincing. Just, just, just no, from I, I can, a perspective I, I, of, I want to see him explored. I want to find out more about the Taskmaster mm. aspect of his kind of sphere. Uh, and I want to see into, you know, kind of just more about him. I want to find out a lot yeah. more. There's just not enough there. And I just think there's a lot of potential. Like if the next big <laughs> realm in Elder Scrolls 6 was with Periite, I would be keen. I just... It's just like, hey man, wel- welcome to management. Um, <laughs> this is my realm. And, uh, you know, uh, this is Shireen here. And, uh, uh, you know, sh- sh- she's the receptionist. Gotta and, get uh, coffee. And you get well acquainted with a janitor over here. And, <laughs> and instead of loading screens, you have really long waiting rooms. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I think yeah. that wraps it well, up. I think that's it. Mehrun's Dagon, the top Daedra. That's our subjective favorite. If you were to go from a consensus amongst us. But uh, yeah, there you go. We had a bit of a fun one um, this time around because we wanted to discuss. We were, we were going to go into a sp- particular Daedric Prince, but then we couldn't really decide on what. So we can kind of like put this out here and now you guys might get inspired by like all... Oh, which one I want to see more dedicated episodes to, but we'll go in. We'll probably go in on a more a deeper law discussion uh, next time around. But uh, yeah, hope you all enjoyed. Subscribe, like, and uh, we'll be be back to nerd out with you all again next time. <laughs>